It seems today that the animation world is dominated by reboots, Adult Swim, and Adventure Time. But where are all those good old-fashioned shows on which we used to rely? Well, they're still here. With shows like South Park and The Simpsons still going, it's no shocker that Family Guy is still kicking, albeit a bit differently. Hi, I'm Adrian with Channel Frederator, and today we're going to take a look at how the Griffins and the show in general have changed over the years. This is Then vs. Now, Family Guy. <laughs> Writing and humor. One thing on which we can all agree is that writing has changed significantly. How could it not after having been on air for so many years? It takes any animated series a couple of seasons before they hit their stride. Seth MacFarlane himself said that Family Guy is derived from The Simpsons, which was bound to happen, since the latter is one of the most successful TV series of all time. MacFarlane also mentioned that the formula has been improved from The Simpsons, a rather bold claim since The Simpsons is still on the air. Family Guy's reliance on cutaway and standalone gags was inspired by The Simpsons as well. McFarlane knew how memorable those Simpsons bits were, and wanted to use it as a tool. But whereas The Simpsons used it pretty sparingly, like having Homer daydream about a chocolate land, Family Guy incorporated it as a regular structural device in most episodes. That device became a Family Guy trope that wasn't well received in writing circles, but it was a huge hit with fans and did include some of the show's most memorable moments, like Cookie Monster in Rehab, or Bush hiding in a treehouse after Katrina. In later seasons, the gags are used slightly less often, but are usually much longer when they do throw one in there. An example of this is Alan Rickman's answering machine in Season 7. Hello, Alan Rickman. It's Alan Rickman. It's a very long cutaway that could have been an episode within itself, and the fans loved it. With more recent seasons, Family Guy received harsh criticism regarding their humor. Whereas early seasons had shocking jokes for the sake of making a statement, more recent episodes tend to have shocking jokes just for the sake of being shocking, and purposely pushing boundaries. Some say they're trying to push the envelope as far as they can without being fined by the FCC. The show has also been accused of taking a liberal turn, not just a leftward lean, but a wholesale jump into the anti-wealthy, anti-meat, anti-family far left. Many of the recent episodes lampoon Republicans and generally make fun of right-wing agendas and ideals, like the scene showing how Republicans pray, for example, and for keeping Congress predominantly white through Christ our Lord, amen, or this image of Peter Griffin mocking Donald Trump. Suffice to say, Republican fans have not been happy with recent seasons, some even vowing not to watch the show anymore. Animation The animation improvements were a big discussion amongst fans when it happened, as some liked the new look and some hated it. With every animation show, the current episodes knock the socks off the old ones because of budget growth with popularity. Watching Family Guy now, we see an incredible use of texture enhancements, color adjustments, and just a plain cleaner look. You can just take a look at the opening sequence and it demonstrates the overall improvement of the show. There are shadows added, reflections, and a generally smoother feel. This style change was first put into effect for the Halloween episode with James Wood, called And Then There Were Fewer. The show was now in an HD format and no longer broadcast in 4x3 ratio, but rather 16x9. But some fans prefer the old-fashioned style of the show to the new one. Do you like the new look? Let us know in the comments. Casting Where would we be without the voices of Family Guy? If you're a fan of the show, you're definitely a fan of the voice actors behind the work. Most of them have stayed the same, but there are some changes worth mentioning. One interesting change is that William H. Macy was set to play the role of Brian. When you ask yourself, how did such a renowned and well-known actor get the boot? You have to ask yourself, could I ever hear Brian's voice being anything different than what it is? Uh, is, is that a beer hall? Oh yes, Munich is renowned for its historic beer halls. It's actually a widely used impression on media platforms like YouTube and Vine. If the voice were William H. Macy's, then it would seem like we're all just doing a William H. Macy impression. Well, Seth did the voice during the pilot, and the executive producers could not imagine it being anything different, so it stuck. Hey, barkeep, whose leg do you have to hump to get a dry martini around here? Another voice worth mentioning is that of Meg, which has been on its own journey, maybe even more than her character. Not many people know this, but she's been voiced by four different people in the show's lifespan. It all started within the family. Seth MacFarlane's sister, Rachel MacFarlane, actually voiced Meg in the initial pilot. She was quickly replaced by Cree Summer, who you may know as Winifred from NBC's A Different World, or who you may know in the voice acting world as Elmira from Tiny Toon Adventures and Susie from Rugrats. Cree was fired for not quite nailing the voice, which she herself admitted she knew she didn't do a great job, and was just waiting until they noticed. She was then replaced by Lacey Chabert, but that didn't last long either, since Lacey only voiced Meg for the first season, and then left to continue school and her role in Party of Five. Lacey was then replaced by then 15-year-old Mila Kunis, who's retained the role to this day. The voice of Death himself was also recast. Oh, I made a mistake, huh? Then what do you call this? SNL's Norm MacDonald originally voiced the sarcastic and hilarious voice of Death, but was later replaced by Adam Carolla, who many fans of the show rioted against. Maybe they feel like Death cheated them. Wouldn't mind finding that thing myself. 
The voice of Angela, Peter's no-nonsense, hard-ass boss at Pawtucket Brewery, hasn't changed yet, but will have to be if they continue to have her appear in the show. Her voice was done by Carrie Fisher, who sadly passed away in December 2016. Fisher did already record two episodes for 2017, but the show will have to recast that role if Angela comes back for more shipping department shenanigans. Peter goes from misogynist to unlearning fool. Okay, enough about the voices, let's get into the characters themselves. First up, Peter. Peter used to be the clear protagonist and centerpiece, with nearly all episodes revolving around him and the other family members, and Dog, having to settle for secondary stories and subplots. Now we get episodes focused on other family members, like Brian and Stewie. Peter's personality also changed a bit. At the start of the show, he was incredibly misogynistic and only slightly unintelligent. She's suing you and the company for sexual harassment. Shara, Shara, I don't... Oh, she the one we videotaped taking a dump? His character then slowly turned into straight moron in the later seasons, almost flanderizing his character with the over-exaggeration of stupidity. The misogyny is now gone, and it's pure idiocy that rules his behavior. In the earlier seasons, there also used to be some sort of lesson that Peter learned after his many screw-ups, but now he just rolls around in a pile of jokes, never learning from his mistakes. That's not to say these jokes are without merit. If you tune in now, you'll be slapped with some pretty funny yet standalone material, but the lessons have been long abandoned. Another change from earlier earlier seasons is Peter's job. He used to work for Happy Go Lucky Toys, whereas now he works at the Pawtucket Brewery, much more suited to the alcoholic family man who loves his beer. He certainly loves it more than he loves Meg. Thanks, didn't want to pay for the whole. Meg and Chris become punchlines. Meg has long been a topic of discussion, and not just because of the voice changes. In earlier seasons, Meg is a normal teenage girl trying to fight her way through high school and find puppy love with all the popular boys. How about a movie? I don't go out with dudes. Many episodes centered around her, dealing with things like prom and peer pressure. Peter, her unruly father, would always get in the way, usually trying to protect her or be there for her. Nowadays, however, Meg has been dubbed the punching bag. Everyone in the family seems to hate her, or at least find her pathetic. Even Lois, who seems to be the most loving one. Mom, she's so sad and lonely. Look who the f is talking. Meg runs out of the room crying more often than not, which many fans find very funny, but others feel that Meg bashing has run its course. Some fans prefer to see her back in her element as a struggling prepubescent with normal problems exaggerated by her funky family. Chris has actually undergone a similar change. Both he and Meg have gone from the normal team with enough angst to fill the family glass to punchline characters that rarely get their own storyline. You'll still see that stupid monkey pointing and watching him from time to time, but the day where where Chris goes to school and wants to ask a girl out is over. Stewie's character arc. Looking at viewer reactions, Stewie seems to have had the most positive development. He first attracted our attention by running around with grenades and laser guns that he built himself by trying to kill his own mother, and by aiming for world domination. But his character has been much more developed since then, and less flanderized in recent years. Now many of the best episodes have surrounded the baby, from romance stories to time travel experiences. He looks for his own father, learns lessons, and yes, officially gives up trying to kill Lois. His new newfound partnership with Brian in later seasons is a fan favorite watch, and if you ask me, should have been the spin-off series instead of the Cleveland show. They even got their own little mini-series in the show, in the Road 2 episodes. Oh, yes, and Stewie's gay. Or so seems to be the audience consensus. I say, what the devil is all the fuss about? I don't get it. What's in there? Bing bong! Hello! Stewie's seen hitting on many men throughout the show, and it's very endearing to watch his love for his male Teddy Rupert. However, many will say he's bisexual, since he's also been hitting on women in the series. When asked about about Stewie's sexuality, McFarlane said that there was a lost episode upon cancellation called Queer is Stewie, but then it turned into an episode about finding his future self. McFarlane wanted to keep his sexuality a little vague, since Stewie's only a one-year-old. However, McFarlane did confirm it outside the show, saying, ultimately, Stewie will be gay, or a very unhappy repressed heterosexual. It also explains why he's so hell-bent on killing his mother Lois and taking over the world. He has a lot of aggression, which comes from confusion and uncertainty about his orientation. Brian's character arc. Besides Stewie, Stewie, Brian's character arc has had the most change in the series. Brian has been since forgotten as the best friend of Peter, which seemed like an easy plug-in in the beginning. Maybe the writers thought if your dog was your best friend and was able to talk, his jokes and advice would be hilarious. But indeed, he went from man's best friend to baby's best friend. Over the course of the series, Brian and Stewie's relationship organically formed, partially since both characters are based on beings that shouldn't even be able to speak, so they easily have that in common. Though he dated many women, the one that stuck for a while was Jillian Russell Wilcox, who we met in Whistle while your wife works in season 5. She was voiced by Drew Barrymore and though they broke up in season 6, she had appearances all the way up until season 12's Life of Brian episode, where yes, Brian was killed off. Don't worry, he was only dead for a couple episodes.
episodes and came back in Christmas Guy in December 2013. Thankfully so, cause not many fans love their new dog, Vinny. Ryan's character also kind of turned into an asshole in later seasons. He used to be the absolute voice of reason with Lois, being the only thing that made him off kilter because of his love for her. We've all had a pet that loves our significant others more than us, but in recent seasons, Ryan's now become an extreme leftist liberal who's also a womanizer. Maybe the years of Lois failing to return his love turn him against women. He's seen time and time again picking up ladies and degrading them, and his comments have turned sullen and mean. Hey Cheryl, get your fat ass over here before I dump you! One thing that's remained the same is that he's still an alcoholic. It's interesting that the two most satirical characters have been developed the most and have been partnered together in many of the most beloved episodes. And one thing's for sure, we would totally watch their spinoff. There you have it, I'm Adrian and thanks for watching Then vs Now Family Guy. Do you like the newer episodes more than the original? Comment below and let us know. Don't forget to click the bell icon to become part of the notification squad. We have new videos dropping every day, so make sure to subscribe to Channel Frederator, your cartoon central on the internet.